Video show. He's been on many times and he's been forecasting that this is exactly the type of thing that would be happening. This is a long term trend and that's what Mr. Dent specializes in. Harry Dent is a founder of Dent Research, an economic forecasting firm specializing in demographic trends. His mission is helping people understand change. In his book, The Great Boom Ahead, that was published in 1992, Mr. Dent accurately forecasted the unanticipated boom of the 90s, and the continued expansion into 2007. In his most recent book, The Demographic Cliff, he continues to educate audiences about his predictions for the next Great Depression, especially between 2014 and 2019, that he's now been forecasting for over 20 years. He's an editor of the Survive and Prosper newsletter. His website is harrydent.com. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Dent. Uh, your mission is helping people understand change. Help us understand what's going on today. Well, you know, David, as we've been saying, it's really very simple. We had a very strong combination of new technologies, internet, computers, wireless phones, broadband, all these things, just like autos and electricity and the roaring 20s and stuff. These technologies were moving mainstream, brought in and accentuated by the largest generation in history, not just here, but all around the world, the baby boom generation. So what? that's why we focus on demographics. It's people that basically innovate when they're young. It's people who spend and raise their kids and buy houses and all the big things in the economy and borrow money to do that in that state. And it's people who finally save and invest for their retirement. And and, and economists ignore this because they weren't taught this. I learned this in, in my marketing courses in, in college and Harvard Business School. And then, and then I learned how things move in stages at, at, at Harvard Business School and Bain and & Company. And so I've always looked at, at stages of technology and innovation, and I've always looked at demographics. Those are two things economists really don't understand at all, and they will tell you where the economy is going, not just a year or two from now, which is not good. I can tell you what's going to happen, and we've been doing this since the late 80s. We've been predicting the major changes in economics and economy and markets since the late 80s when I put these two things together after 10 years of research. So it's a different approach. It's something people understand because it's about people. Everything I do is not about governments, whether they're going to do more QE or not, or whether they're going to stimulate this way or run deficits or not. All of these things have uh, an impact. Zillions of people around the world have a much greater impact. And I know what people do from cradle to grave down to when they spend the most money on potato chips, not just when they spend the most money overall at age 46 to 47. Exactly right. And when we look at this, everybody's saying, well, you know, the Chinese markets are crashing, so everything else is crashing. But what is really driving this, of course, as you're pointing out, is a global economic slowdown that is demographically based. I mean, the reason that their manufacturing inventories are going up is because people are buying less. It's one of the reasons why the oil uh, prices are crashing is because the Saudis kept production up even though demand was crashing. And so that's really the driving force on all this, isn't it, Mr. Dennis? The demand that's, that, that is crashing. Yeah, this is a reflection demand, of that. Exactly. People say, you know, supply driven or something. Don't produce more when there isn't demand. Every, people are saying, oh, we need to, to, you know, produce more and invest more. No, we over expanded in the great boom with too much debt. Consumers overbought with too much debt, and now those two things are going the other way. We've got oversupply, falling demand, increasingly indebtedness. And the point I make, David, which is even more important, no matter what we did in the United States and what Europe did, China is the new player on the block, and they did something nobody's ever done. They overbuilt their economy at every level, housing, basic infrastructures, industrial capacity. And, and created more debt pushed by and guaranteed by the government than any country relatively in the same time, moved 500 million people in the last two and a half decades from rural areas to cities, the biggest migration ever. Hey, that's natural, but they did it all too fast on steroids. What is causing this final bubble to burst, which, which needs to burst because demographics and debt need to kind of let this thing deleverage, is China has been the biggest thing keeping this global bubble going. We've been predicting for years, China is slowing. They're not growing at 7%. They're lying about that. They're growing at 3 to 4%. But at some point, their real estate bubble, way bigger than ours, five times bigger than ours, uh, was. 
and and their overbuilding bubble is going to burst, and China's burst is, is going to continue to kill commodity prices. That kills emerging countries around the world, which do have good demographics, and it backs up on us. And that's what's happening right now. Why is our market going down today, 1,100 points at worst on the Dow, even though it bounced back? Because China's market collapsed last night to new lows, and it's down like 40%. In the last few months, that's saying a bubble is bursting. We've already seen our bubble start to burst in 2008, many other bubbles around the world. But China is the epicenter of this global demographic slowdown and this global excess of debt and credit and global financial asset bubbles. You only get asset bubbles, stocks and real estate and all these things, when credit is easy and cheap, especially artificially by the government. And when those things burst, they don't correct, and they don't correct slowly, they crash. So we've been warning uh, your audience and our subscribers that you should get out of this bubble early, a bit early, not late, because once it goes down, you see things like now where, where you know markets are down 6% in one day. In, in 1987, and this is during a boom, but we did have a bubble in stocks in the 87, we saw stocks correct 40%, in just two weeks, and 20%, half of that, 20% in one day. So we're telling people this is not a correction, not something you should sit through. We told people to get out ahead of it. Now it's starting to get crazy. It's going to go up and down because it went down 1,100 points a day and back up 1,000 from there. We're going to see this with a downside bias for a couple years and even more years off and on. This is a time to protect your capital get out of the markets, protect yourself, live in a safe place, do everything you can. This is going to be the worst downturn, the worst crash we see in our lifetimes. And I've been saying that not just in the last few years. I've been saying this since my research came together in the late 80s. You know, it's amazing. This article that we uh, covered earlier that was on the Drudge Report about a former advisor to Gordon Brown, former prime minister of the UK, and he's talking about a full-on prepper. He's telling people, get your water, get your food. I mean, what do you think about that, Mr. Dan? I mean, he's looking, he's talking to people as if this is an impending uh, major crisis that is going to go way beyond anything that's uh, just a stock market sell-off. He believes, as uh, many of us do, that this is going to be a massive societal change. He looks like he thinks it's going to be a disruption that could threaten people's survival. They need to get their own supply of food and water. Well, you know, that's where it gets harder to predict, but I, I do lean in that direction because it's not just our demographic cycle. I have a geopolitical cycle that goes back 200 years, going up for 18 years, everything's hunky dory in the world, and then down. We've been in a down cycle since 9-11, 2001 to 2019 or 20. So what we see happening in the Middle East and, and around the world and Russia and Ukraine, this is only going to get worse by this cycle, and it may start to turn around in four or five years. Um, so when, when we put all our cycles together, I have four long-term cycles that all point down between 2014 and early 2020. Some point down longer, but that is the danger period. We also have short-term, what I call the crash season. When there are major downturns in the stock market and economy, the worst crashes tend to come between mid-August, just recently, as we're starting to see in mid-October. So I am seeing... In the next four years, especially in an extreme danger zone, and so I tell people, yes, go across the board, not just get out of stocks and real estate and, and have cash and liquid stuff you can use to survive because cash is king in a downturn, especially a deflationary downturn where, where everything is going down, uh, all assets, um, the economy, everything, prices of consumer goods are going down. But also where you live, if you're in a major city, you want to be in the outskirts, on the exurban edges. If you can move to a smaller town or to a safer place in the Caribbean, so and so, do that. Be in a safer place. Don't be in a bubble city, especially. Don't be in downtown New York or San Francisco or Miami, the places that have bubbled the worst. And yes, you should have some provisions up. You should be saying, what if we have some civil unrest? What if our infrastructures go down for a period of time? You know, do I have basic things? I think all of that is warranted. I, I don't know how extreme that will be because one of the problems I have is we don't have a precedent for this. Our cycles work up and down throughout history. We've had inflationary periods like the 70s, deflationary periods like the 30s, and they're always the worst. 
But we've never seen a period like this where the where there's been so much stimulus and so much stretching of the economy and printing of money and free money um, and so much uh, polarity between the rich and the everyday people that, I mean, that polarity alone says there's going to be conflict. The fact that that the more Democratic and Republican sides of our economy can't agree on anything, because they're both blaming each other for this bubble and this crisis means, you know, there there is definitely much more likely to be some level of civil unrest. I, I, I would just be happier to be here than China. Otherwise, uh, you know, this this country does definitely have potential for that. You know, it, it's amazing, as I pointed out in the uh, in, in the last segment, even Henry Kissinger is sounding the warning about how close we are to war, questioning yeah. why we are pushing above all else against Russia, pushing so hard in an area where obviously the Ukraine has always been attached uh, to, to Russia. They see that just as if it was uh, a part of the United States that had been annexed uh, about that long ago. And so even Henry Kissinger is questioning this and saying, well, what are they doing? Why are they pushing to war? Of course, he knows what the long-term plan is. He would rather see this assimilated gradually. We're talking to Harry Dent, harrydent.com, founder of Dent Research. We're going to be right back, talk to him about long-term demographic changes. What's coming in 2020? Many people have talked about that specific date. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, your host. Alex Jones is going to be joining us in the next hour live. We had him at the beginning of the show commenting about how this was something that was not unexpected. We've had many guests who have been predicting this over the last several months. Of course, this has been going on even longer than that. We've been seeing this build up as a demographic trend, as actions that our government has been taking, preparing for a massive collapse. They know it. We know it. Many people have predicted it. None better than Harry Dent. And of course, he is a an expert on demographic trends. His book, his most recent book, The Demographic Cliff, is about a great sea change that we're going to see between 2014 and 2019. He wrote this many years ago. We are now in the middle of this. He was on just a couple of months ago, I think, or maybe just uh, about within the last month, predicting that this was going to be happening in the September, early September time frame. And here we are. It's happening right about that time frame. I'm going to get back to uh, Mr. Dent in just one moment. Before I do, I just want to let you know that we now have Survival Shield X2 nascent iodine in stock. This hour of the Alex Jones Show is brought to you by your support of the products that we sell at InfoWarsLife.com. Survival Shield X2 nascent iodine has over 400 reviews on InfoWarsLife.com. Over 99% of the respondents would recommend this to a friend or a family member. It's a great way for you to prepare to stock up so that you have nutritional supplements as well as food and water available in case there is some kind of a crisis. Let me read you a couple of the reviews that are on uh, InfoWarsLife.com about Survival Shield X2. We got one from DB in Minnesota. He says, I really like this product. The biggest plus I've noticed is more energy and just feeling all around better. I strongly recommend this product and I'm grateful to Alex for offering it. Another one from Special K and Winter Springs, Florida says, I love Survival Shield X2 nascent iodine. Helps bring focus and clarity to my mind. It also improves the quality of my sleep. Thank you, InfoWars Life, for sourcing 200 million year old salt water salt solutions found more than 7,000 feet below the Earth's surface for this high quality formula. Yes, it's a very pure form of iodine. And again, we have a sale on Silver Bullet. You can get 30% off. This is a sale that is going to end on Wednesday. Uh, you can get 30% off or you can buy two silver bullet, get two free. Again, that's at InfoWarsLife.com. Getting back to uh, Harry Dent, uh, Mr. Dent, your time frame that you have on this is 2014 to 2019. Of course, it's based on demographic trends with baby boomers. Tell us what you think is going to happen in 2020 because we've seen so many people uh, predicting these massive sea changes happening around 2020. I've seen this over and over again from every kind of scientific uh, prediction of, about the future to uh, a government prediction. They all say, yeah, well, by 2020, we're going to have this, we're going to have that, we're the self-driving cars or this or that. Uh, you picked 2019. Why did you pick that date? Well, you know, it, it's really uh, by the end of 2019, our demographic trends in the United States bottom between 2020 and 22. If it were demographic trends alone, I'd say we don't really turn around until 2023 forward. 
But we have this geopolitical cycle that's been negative since uh, 9-11, and that bottoms around late 2019, early 2020. And that, that'll be the first thing to turn up. Um, and we have a, a 10-year boom-bust cycle that turns up around early 2020. So we have a number of cycles. The demographics get as bad as it's going to get by 2020. So I'd say somewhere around late 1990, early 2020, we're going to see the worst of this. But we won't really, I think, see the next global boom. Uh, and it won't be as strong as the last one until around late 2022, early 2023, when I look at all of our cycles. So it's a broader view. I don't just look at demographics. Demographics just happens to be the most important and most predictable cycle we have. I mean, I can quantify it down. Again, we said 20 some years ago, baby boomers would peak by late 2007 and we would start an economic slowdown. And we did that. And we were about to crash into the next Great Depression. And then governments and central banks came around and printed like $10 trillion, four and a half in the United States alone, to fill in the gap. So this has been an artificial rally. All the money's gone to speculation, hasn't gone to lending and, and new jobs and new factories and production. It's just artificial. And it's just created another bubble. All this Free money created by the government has created an even bigger bubble in one thing, not in inflation, not in growth, in financial assets. So you got to get out of financial assets. So the biggest thing we see happening is all financial assets, commodities, even gold, um, bonds and stuff are going to deflate stocks into around 2019, 2020. Then the trends can start pointing up again. But until then, it's just better to be safe. Again, we're talking to Harry Dent of Harry Dent Research. We're going to be right back with him, and we're going to talk about what happens with the economy as we turn the corner. But as you heard, get out of the stock market. He was making this prediction before. We'll be right back. Alex Jones is traveling. He's in the air right now while we're on the air. He's going to be joining us live, however, in the next hour. He joined us with a special report that he cut about the, what's going on in the stock market today. He cut that before he got on the plane. He will be joining us in the third hour. Right now, we are talking to Harry Dent, founder of Dent Research. And of course, he's an economic forecaster. He's been on the show many times. I'm sure that you've heard him and most recently predicting that we're going to have exactly this type of thing happening in this type of time frame, cautioning people to get out of the inflated stock market. That we have this economic bubble, this financial bubble where they have poured all of this quantitative easing, all this money that's been printed has essentially, as he pointed out just before we went to break, it's found its way not in any other kind of economic growth except for a growth in a bubble stock market. Mr. Dent, you're talking about demographics, and I think one of the uh, that's one of the key trends that you look at when you're you're uh, forecasting. What about the massive influx of immigrants that we're seeing? In the United States, as well as in Europe, we had uh, 3,000 immigrants uh, rescued in a single day in Italy over this weekend. We've had uh, the Obama administration incentivize massive immigration into our country. How does that play into the demographics that we have with the baby boomers? Well, uh, first of all, it has greatly increased the demographics of the baby boom generation, even more than the millennial generation that followed them. Um, and we've been an immigrant um, nation um, Forever, uh, especially the late 1800s, early 1900s, greatest immigration surge ever. And then we saw the great bubble and boom into the roaring 20s because of the technologies and that. It was much more immigration than births back then. Uh, now we've seen another immigration surge that peaked um, recently and, and will decline for many, many years. Uh, because in a bad economy, countries don't want to let as many immigrants in. And in a bad economy, immigrants don't want to take the risk of moving and, and yes, we, we've had a, a huge illegal immigrant problem, but to send them all back, as Donald Trump says, to me is too much. It, it, you got to say, look, here's a period to reapply, do X, Y, and Z. If you don't, we'll send you back. But if you suddenly sent back 11 million people, it would cost a fortune, and the economy would go into recession on that alone. My view is this. Again, what, what a country should do, and I lecture a lot in Canada and Australia, uh, these are countries that have a great immigration policy. They want immigration, but you have to not only just be legal, you have to qualify to be in. You got to be in the skills they need. You got to prove your valuable economy. 
Australia and Canada have very good immigration. Our immigration has still helped bolster our economy and take jobs that mean people wouldn't. But in a downturn, I'm telling you, we're going to turn anti-immigration. Oh, in yeah. a moment. That's what happened in, in the Great Depression. The greatest immigration surge in all of U.S. history went down to zero in the 1930s when the economy flopped. We're seeing that happening already in Europe. There were reports this weekend about what was going on in Germany. Uh, they had demonstrators there who were attacking the police who were guarding immigrants who had come into the country. And, and I guess when I look at this, what you're talking about is how we have to make sure that people have the ability to take care of themselves. Absolutely. But we're doing exactly the opposite. We're paying them to come in. We're incentivizing them to come in. We're telling them, come in, you can get free this, you can get free that, you can get college tuition and state rates at any state in the nation. And now we've got on the Democrat side, we've got Hillary Clinton as well as Bernie Sanders saying, let's give everybody free college. If you do that and you pull in the people, the dreamers that uh, Obama is incentivizing to come in, remember those kids, those children are considered to be children all the way up to the age of 31. That's what he considers to be children. That's how they've redefined children. So if they open up and give everybody free college tuition, that is truly going to be a massive, massive increase of the welfare state. Just as we're going to see a massive increase in the welfare state as people have to pay for uh, more schools. We're seeing massive increases of people coming in. And we say, we'll give a free education to anybody in the world. And we'll, we'll even let you pick what language you want to get schooled in. And we'll send the bill to the people who own homes in the area. I mean, that's what we're seeing happening now. Well, you know, David, I, I hate to say we have the most convoluted immigration policy in history. I tell you, in, in the coming decades, all developed nations, except for a few small ones from Israel to Australia, are going to be declining in population, workforce, everything, because we're not having enough babies and immigrants help replace it. But you have to have an immigration policy that makes sense and that attracts the right people and, and that's why we should study Australia and Canada and Switzerland and countries like this that have done it successfully. We've done it haphazardly and it's still worked to our advantage overall, but it's going to be a huge issue because we didn't do it the right way. And now we got to debate how do we undo it? And I don't agree with the extreme of Trump saying send them all back and then bring the best ones back in, but we got to do something to get clear about this and have better policies. But I tell you, David, I don't think immigration is going to be a big policy in a downturn that I'm predicting in the next four to seven or eight years. Immigrants are not going to want to go in as much and, and people here are even more not going to want them to come in. Immigration is going to, it is already net zero for many years in Mexico, our biggest immigration. So it's, I think it's going to go down even more. I don't think we need to build the wall yet because I don't think there's going to be a, a lot of immigration in a down economy. That's something to worry about for the next boom. We need to shoulder up our financial markets and our banking systems and stuff that are way out of kilter and have been totally killed by special interest. Special interest is the worst single thing in our economy. We can't change health care. We can't change education. We can't fight inflation. We can't deleverage debt because there's too many fan financial interests that have bought their way into politics that won't let the politicians on either side do it. So we, we almost, one of the reasons I welcome this kind of downturn and this collapse, it's going to bring everybody into reality. We've got to get back down to what are we really doing? How do we really grow? We don't grow by stocks buying, uh, companies buying back their stocks. We don't grow by printing free money. We don't grow by having zero interest rates which just causes people to misinvest and stuff. We grow by saving and investing in productive capacity, creating new jobs, attracting good immigrants that are necessary, and having more babies. You know, that's how we grow down the road. And technological innovation, which we kill through all types of excessive regulation. So there's so many things we could do right. We've been doing the wrong things because special interests have been driving the economy the way they want it through the politicians. And that, if I had to say number one thing I would do if I were Donald Trump and won the presidency, and this is one thing I agree with him on, clearly, you've got to kill this thing where special interests can fund politicians and get them elected. That should not be allowed. Absolutely. I, you mentioned technological innovation. Let, let me ask you in, in your uh, analysis, how do you see 
the predictions of massive automation and robotics and the displacement of workers, how do you see that playing out? A lot of people say, well, we've had a lot of these types of displacing disruptive technologies in the past. We've seen it happen with agriculture. We've seen it happen with manufacturing. But then on the other hand, we've had people who have said, this is something that is so broad based, it's going to hit every industry at the same time in a massive way. Are we going to look at 50% unemployment? I know some people will be fixing some robots, some people will be manufacturing robots for a while, then manufacture, robots can manufacture themselves. But how do you see this shaking out in your analysis? Okay, David, how, how do you get more extreme than 80% of agriculture and mining and trapping workers going down to 2% today over the last century and a half? We always displace old jobs and create better ones. We went from agriculture to industry, production and manufacturing, from manufacturing to high level service. I don't mean just clerical stuff and McDonald's and stuff. I mean healthcare, financial services, high technology, these sort of stuff. Every change in technology throughout history, and this is so consistent, if you look at history, you can't miss it, destroys old industries and jobs and creates new ones. The automobiles and in tractors and trucks and buses, and then eventually airplanes, help destroy the railroad industry. They're a tiny thing now, but we're much better off. There will be new jobs created. My fear is they'll be created somewhere else because our demographics are weakening, we're aging. If we don't do something to change that, if we don't encourage innovation and higher birth rates and things, which some countries in Europe have, and which Australia has, and, and Israel is like the best demographic wealthy nation in the world forward, and they're a leader in technology. That's the key to going forward. You got to go with the technology. You can't fight it and say, oh, robotics are going to replace a lot of factory work. Well, you know. Well, oh, certainly, yeah, you can't, you can't legislate that out of existence. But I guess what I've seen a lot of people say is, yeah, we've seen this happen with industry after industry, but we have the potential with this particular disruptive technology to have it happen to so many different industries simultaneously, to the service industry, to the transportation industry, to white collar, blue collar jobs. I mean, you know, everybody, we're not gonna need truck drivers nearly as much as we do now, perhaps, is what a lot of people are saying in terms of package delivery, long-term haul, that type of thing. So there's gonna be so many different industries affected simultaneously that even if we eventually adjust to this, it might send this shock through the system of 50% unemployment or 60% unemployment for a few years before we can adjust to that shock. Do you see that coming? Are you concerned yeah, about that? Yeah. No, I don't. Temporarily, yes. David, I mean, I, I've studied history more than anybody I know. And, and, and we got computers that I call left brain machines. They can do everything from bookkeeping to, and robotics can do, auto, you know, typical routine tasks in factories and stuff. They can even do a lot of what doctors and nurses do and, all, and, and financial advisors and everything. But what, what this revolution is about is forcing everyday people with common sense, creative, relational skills, which computers have none of that, at least not yet, not for a long time, to become entrepreneurs, whether you're an entrepreneur running a small part of a corporation, a team of three or four people that has a set of customers, and you're making decisions. Now, people are good at making decisions that balance off different trade-offs, relating to people, creating, finding new opportunities. Everyday people, I, I once heard a guy at a, at a conference say, 95% of people are a genius at something. You yeah. know, and everybody else is my brother-in-law, you know? That's right, everybody uh, has a different kind of an intelligence. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's about leveraging what computers can't do. And that's about making, what we do that computers can't do is we create new stuff new ideas. We relate to people. We understand their needs at a level a computer never could. I have a whole part of a chapter in chapter eight in the demographic cliff, and I've had this in every book for the last 20 years, and nobody listens to it. The network corporation, you run companies from the bottoms up, organized around the customers, not the back lines and the bureaucrats and the managers. You automate all the bureaucracy, you make decisions in real time, and you let the customer drive your company, your front lines or your browsers, your backline experts and production facilities or your servers. The management isn't there to tell people what to do. They're there to orchestrate a network that runs with no management, just like the stock exchanges. You, you, you ring the bell at 930 in the morning like today, stocks are down 1,100 points, and then at the end of the day, they're, they're back up another 1,000. 
It all happens with no orchestration. The, the computer technologies allow us to have a whole different model of interacting globally, locally, bottoms up, not top down. And when you make an everyday person an entrepreneur instead of a robot, which they are today, that's why they're being replaced by robots, you have a whole revolution. That's going to take a while, but I'll tell you, you never lose by advancing technologies. I've studied history back as far there, as there were ever humans. You never lose. Some people lose. And for time periods you lose, you never lose with advancing technology. I understand. Yes, I, I agree. But and just to clarify, do you see this as something that is going to happen, though, in the time frame of the 2019, 2020, that there's going to be some kind of an economic shock while we go through a period of adjustment? Or do you think yeah, it's well, going to be a relatively easy transition to this? No, 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 it's not an easy transition. It does take a shock. You know, it's like, you, you know, your heart stops and they got to go, go, boom, you know, <laughs> they got to reshock you going. It does take a shock. Management doesn't like this. The people in charge don't like this. Wall Street doesn't like this. We need to shift to this new network bottoms up economy. And the people in power still want it to be a top down economy. It's going to take this kind of breakdown to have a breakthrough. So it'll take many decades for us to see the benefits of this. The whole assembly line revolution and automobiles, the whole um, Alfred Sloan corporate model of decentralizing decision making in the product lines and instead of like the railroads, everything was top down. That took decades to fully manifest into an affluent economy, middle class economy in the 50s and 60s. But the shock that made it happen was the depression of the 1930s. It forced companies that weren't doing the right things to fail and the ones that were doing the right things to accelerate and get more market share. So this is part, the winter season we talk about is part about shifting to the whole new spring season of the next longer term boom with, you know, growing demographics again, with whole new sets of technologies. But the most important impact I found, David, through studying history is not just the cell phones let us communicate better or the internet and stuff. It's that they change the business model of everything, small businesses, large businesses, governments. It changes the business model and makes everybody more productive. You know, you mentioned uh, the winter season that we're coming into and then followed by a spring season. Uh, are you familiar with the works of uh, Strauss and Howe where they talk about uh, a cyclical thing? And, and, and how do you feel about that? I mean, they predicted the fourth turning around uh, the same type of time frame that you're talking about a winter yeah. season. They predicted a, a fourth turning where we might have something along the lines of the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War II. Uh, these types of things happening every 70 to 80 years. Do you, do you believe that's a, a trend that you see? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did the whole thing demographically and the effects on the market and the economy. They did it, after, you know, in 1989, about the same time I was putting out the, the, uh, my first book, they did it all about the political and social impacts. When their book came out, I was like, praise God <laughs> that these people came out and, and basically filled in the side that I'm not as much an expert. In. I love Strauss and Howe. Mm -hmm. They have tracked history like I have. They've seen these 40 and 80 year generation cycles, which I see. They see these revolution cycles. And I, I've got an even bigger cycle, David, that back to the Revolutionary War and the Industrial Revolution and in, in the birth, really, of capitalism with Adam Smith, that was in the late 1700s. We're in a similar revolution cycle in this decade and perhaps the next where we're going to see major changes in our social, political, and capitalistic and business models and technology models. And, and it, 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 you know, 50 years from now, things are going to be massively different. But we have to go through this winter season this deleveraging, I call it a financial detox in the next decade. And governments have been trying to prevent that by preventing this, as Japan has done. Japan's only extended their um, winter season and they've never gone into spring. Japan's 20 years ahead of us on this cycle because of their demographics and their generation. They've just put it off with endless QE. It's the wrong thing to do. Trust the wisdom of natural systems like you would trust your own body if you ate bad sushi to flush it out as fast as possible. Great You're advice. We're talking to Harry Dent, founder of Dent Research. We're going to be right back and I want to ask you a question about if you see war in this massive turn. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We'll be joined in the next hour by Alex Jones live. He's in the air at the moment while we're on the air, but he will be landing and calling in to 
give us an update on his take as to what's been happening today. Of course, we've been talking about this for a very long time at Infowars.com. We have many articles up right now. If you look at uh, our website, why is everyone freaking out about September 2015? An article by Paul Joseph Watts, another one. Flashback, world-renowned economist warns of coming crash of all crashes. This is about Martin Armstrong's predictions. We're talking to Harry Dent, who has also been on our program many times, warning about this exact thing. We're going to get back to Mr. Dent of uh, Dent Research in just a moment. I wanted to ask him, because we are talking before the break, about the cyclical nature of these uh, these different trends, the demographic natures of them, as well as uh, he was familiar with the work of Strauss and how he looked at this from an economic standpoint. They came along and looked at it from a political uh, standpoint. And so I want to ask him if he sees in this winter season, as he calls it, or in the fourth turning, as they call it, if he sees a war coming up just briefly. Uh, at InfoWarsLife.com, we now have Prostagard back in stock. Prostagard uses plant-based nutrients and antioxidants to naturally support the prostate. Our advanced formula contains a hand-selected blend of sol palmetto, lycopene, plant sterols, zinc, vitamin D3, selenium, and copper. It's something I take every day. For my research, it's something that men should really be adding to their daily routine, especially as you get older. Again, that's Prostagard. You can find that at InfoWarsLife.com. Mr. Dent, as uh, we were talking about in the last segment, uh, we look at the historical cycles of this, uh, about 70 or 80 years, you said you had identified this as well in your research, mainly from an economic standpoint. Strauss and Howe did it from a political uh, standpoint. When we look at this, what we've seen in the past are things like World War II, then 70 or 80 years before that, the Civil War, 70 or 80 years before that, the Revolutionary War. Do you see a war coming in this winter season, as you call it? I do, but we've already we've already seen it. It's a different type of thing. It's not like there's two giant powers or three giant powers that have a major war like World War One or World War Two. Uh, what we've seen is, is since, and I pay more attention to our geopolitical cycle, which has been down from 2001 into 2019 or 20. That is the cycle when you have these sort of conflicts the most. And, 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 you know, we had the Iraq war and then the Afghanistan war. We've had civil wars throughout the Middle East. We've had terrorism around the world, civil wars in Africa. I mean, this this is it. And, and since we don't have China cannot attack the United States, we're not going to have war with China except for economic. Um, the biggest threat right now is Russia moving into Ukraine. It's a Russia versus uh, Europe and U.S. thing. I don't think it's going to be a nuclear war, but I think we're going to see civil wars continue to intensify in the Middle East and parts of the world. And this whole thing with Putin intensifies. So I think it's the same thing. It just continues and it gets worse. I don't think it's World War Three, but there there is going to be continued warfare and tensions. And we even have it internally with all types of racial tensions and stuff in this negative geopolitical cycle. I think that will start to abate four, five, six, seven years from now. And then 15 years from now, I don't think we'll be talking about terrorism as much in civil wars in the Middle East. But between now and then, yes. But I don't see an all-out World War III because I don't see who could really challenge us. It's just going to keep being a war here, a war here, a civil war here, a civil war there. And that's very disruptive to the economy and oil supplies and all types of stuff. Very interesting. We're going to be back with Mr. Dent uh, right after the break, and we're going to talk about his forecast through October because he had predicted the, uh, a turn down early September. We're already starting to see that now. Where does he see this going in the next couple of months? Stay with us. We'll be right back. with. He's Alex Jones on the GCN Radio Network. And now, live from Austin, Texas, Alex Jones. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, your host. We're going to be joined at the bottom of the hour by Alex Jones. Right now, we are talking to Harry Dent, founder of Dent Research. There's an article up on Infowars.com by Paul Joseph Watson. While the media peddled delusion, Infowars predicted the great crash of 2015. He says the financial press were still pretending it was a correction as recently as last week. And of course, as he breaks this down, says this is what we reported nine months ago. As he breaks this down... You'll see on this article featured prominently our guest right now, 
uh, Harry Dent. He talks about how he and Gerald Slinty, Peter Schiff, many others that we've talked to, talked about how this is going to happen. Many people have seen the handwriting on the wall, but not what you'll hear in the mainstream press. So I want to ask Mr. Dent now, where do you see this going in the next couple of months, Mr. Dent? Well, um, David, one of the things we've been warning your audience as well as our subscribers at HarryDent.com is that you bubbles when they burst, they get very violent. They build up violently on the on the upside, and then when they crash, typically the first crash in the first two, three, four months tends to be thirty to forty percent or more. So people who wait for proof wait too late. And China just crashed 35% in three weeks, rebounded, and now it's back to new lows, which means it's going to crash again. The tech wreck in, in early 2000, in the first two and a half months, the NASDAQ was down 40% in two and a half months. It ended up 80% down, but most of it was right away. In the 1929 crash, the first two to three months was down 46%. So I don't really know fully because all crashes are different, and, and, and this time, I tell you, we've been telling people you're, you're not going to see the Fed raise high uh, rates in, in 2015 because we're going to be too weak by then. And, and they may be talking about QE4 before the end of the year. But I think the Dow could go as low as 13,000, be down 30 percent or more just by the middle of October. And one of the reasons for that, David, is that uh, the worst time of year for stocks is mid-August to mid-October, but that is exaggerated in times when we're having bigger corrections or major downturns beginning. So again, I, I, that's why I tell people, you know, we bounce today a uh, thousand points from the bottom after going down 1,100. If we bounce some this week, I just tell people every time there's a bounce, if you haven't already gotten out, get out because short term, the downside could be 30 to 40 percent in the next two, three, four months. And, and by late 2016 to early 2017, as we've said from the beginning, I fully expect the Dow to be at 5,800 or 6,000 or a bit lower, you know, like a 70 percent crash. And that will not be the end of the of the winter season, but it'll be the worst of it. So, wow. And you know, we wow. just keep telling people get out ahead. And, and, and the biggest problem, David, is because I've watched these things forever. Once a crash like this starts. Just like we saw today, when, when the market goes down 1,100, it can go up 1,000 points in the same day. It gets so volatile that everyday people have no chance. It's better to get out when it's good, just let it crash, and then rebuy when we see things better, like in late 2016, early 2017, or farther down the road, and then 2020 to 22. The, 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 the secret, David, is to get out of the way like Joseph Kennedy did in late 29 and reinvest when the crash decimates everything, because playing the crash, unless you're a good trader, is very, very hard because uh, it goes up and down to such extremes. And again, we saw that today on Monday, August 24th, it's just down extremely, the biggest down market we've seen in a long time, and then up almost as much that day to counter it. Who, who can deal with this? Yeah, it's such a major uh, drop. I mean, it dropped over 6%. They yeah. would have stopped trading at 7%. So, I mean, that that's exactly. almost to that limit before it popped back up. So then to reiterate what you're saying and have been saying for a long time is that the fundamentals and the trends don't make sense. Be careful because these crashes are front-loaded. You're going to see the biggest drop at the very beginning. Thank you so much for joining us. Harry Dent, harrydent.com. You can get more information about his forecasts and predictions. Thank you again for joining us, Mr. Dent.